Yes, good morning again. Welcome to this seminar. Now we formally have started on joint purchasing of energy. And we have the opportunity here, I'll put the video on, sorry about that. We will have the opportunity to have three speakers and I'll be also joining in as I'll uh, doing a little presentation on joint purchasing, speaking about different aspects of joint purchasing, competition law and geopolitical implications related to the possibility of buying gas in bulk for different member states. And this is a topic that has been started since already October last year, where we had the first crisis of energy, but is gaining and gaining a lot of momentum now with the current geopolitical situation. And I have the real pleasure to have wonderful speakers today. The first one is Professor Lee Hancher, that she's already here. Lee, if you can, you can come in into the camera. Um, I'll mute here. Lee Hancher is going to give us an introduction to joint purchasing and a moving energy landscape. And what I'll do now is I'll share uh, her slides so you can get uh, an access to them. And with that being said, Lee, the floor is all yours and you have 20 minutes to do your presentation. Okay. Here's that little button. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody online. And good morning um, to uh, <clears throat> our colleagues here in Bergen who have joined us. So <clears throat> I asked um, Ignacio some time ago if it might be interesting to have um, an event on this debate about joint purchasing of gas um, that has emerged uh, recently in Europe. Um, and one of the reasons I thought it would be particularly interesting to hold that debate here in Norway is, of course, Norway is a major exporter to the EU. Um, <clears throat> so joint purchasing of gas by the EU could have some really quite some implications here. But not only that, uh, those of us who know the history of competition law and competition law as applied to the energy sector know that one of the most famous or infamous cases, depending on your point of view, concerned a joint seller uh, arrangement, the GFU. So when I was looking at how things were developing in the EU, I thought, well, have we all forgotten the past? Or should we be rather cynical and say, well, joint purchasing, um, that's one thing, joint selling, well, we don't like that. So it was really um, with that sort of mindset that I thought we should have a closer look at what's going on. So what I'm going to start with is just telling you the background, how things have been evolving and some of the questions um, that are coming up. And of course, it's always easy to ask the questions. Giving the answers is rather difficult, but I have been involved uh, with a think tank, Brogo, um, in looking at some ways we could perhaps work around or with this idea of joint purchasing without falling uh, into the trap of competition law infringement. So, oops. Yeah, and then I click. So then I should click. This one. Okay, right. So <clears throat> joint purchasing is not a new, new idea in Europe. I've always already mentioned joint selling has a bit of an infamous history, but joint purchasing has been something that's been put forward quite often, actually, if you look back uh, into EU energy policy. Uh, for example, um, there was the idea um, to set up a Caspian gas development corporation to buy gas primarily coming in uh, from uh, through the new southern corridor from Azerbaijan. Uh, that was mooted way back in 2010, um, <clears throat> but never really took off. Um, also because people were concerned about competition law issues. Um, it surfaced again uh, when um, a certain president of the US uh, decided it would be a very good idea for Europe uh, to stop buying so much Russian gas, uh, abandon Nord Stream 2, and buy US LNG. And it was again mooted that the best way to do that would be through some joint purchasing arrangement. But again, 
uh, although it was discussed briefly, it never really um, took off as an idea. So why were, were these ideas not followed up? Well, there are many reasons, but competition law on the possible application of antitrust sanctions was certainly one factor. However, um, with the current gas crisis, um, this tool has found its way into the Commission toolbox. And that toolbox was first published back in October last year um, in response to rising gas prices um, and how to deal then uh, with the sudden, very sudden rise in gas prices across Europe. Um, and in December, 15th of December, uh, the Commission published its long awaited decarbonization package. Um, and in that package, uh, there was also um, an option listed um, in, the, in the proposed gas regulation for member states to enter into voluntary arrangements for joint purchasing of low carbon gases and hydrogen, as well as natural gas to deal with security issues. So there was a proposal to amend, in fact, the security of supply of gas regulation uh, that was adopted uh, in 2017. Um, so that was already these, this idea then of having some sort of joint purchasing, purchasing arrangement was already on the table. And then, of course, um, the, the war broke out on the 24th of February. And so we were not just facing a price crisis, but also a supply crisis. So the council, the heads of member state, adopted this new program, the Repower EU, um, in early March. And again, the idea surfaces for a platform for joint procurement, collecting orders and matching supplies. That's all that's said about it. But um, the idea starts to take shape. <clears throat> and in early April 2022, um, a US-EU energy security agreement was um, signed. Um, and this is just, I mean, it's not like a, an official trade agreement, but it's a sort of, you know, non-binding sort of good intentions declaration where <clears throat> the promise was that EU member states would work together to pool demand for US LNG imports um, and especially to attract new volume uh, between April and October of this year um, that would help to fill gas storage uh, where, of course, um, the amount of storage, amount of gas in storage has in many countries been at historic lows. So there was a sort of connection between let's all get together and buy LNG, and uh, that will then be used to fill gas storage facilities throughout Europe so that uh, by the end of October, uh, we would be in a good position uh, for the coming winter. Um, and, and so things were gradually developing and the platform was in fact launched um, and I think uh, the only real sign of life uh, so far um, is that it has a website and it published a press notice at some point uh, where it said that the idea would be that it would work with the member states uh, representatives to maximize le leverage to attract reliable supplies from global markets and at stable prices um, and this would allow moving, when appropriate, towards joint purchases. Now, so it didn't say when it would be considered appropriate, nor who would make that decision. Uh, but the idea would be it transpired in the next Repar e Europe uh, communication that followed in May, uh, late May, uh, that this joint, this joint purchasing platform could actually take the form of a joint venture or a business owned entity. Um, and so uh, it would be assisted uh, by a special task force that would be set up within DG Energy. Um, and also uh, regional task forces would be launched uh, to take the idea forward in different parts, different regions of Europe. And very recently, um, a regional task force for the Balkans uh, and southeastern 
Europe was launched. And it's quite interesting because although I've mentioned that this is a, an EU-wide initiative and the platform will be an EU-wide platform, in fact, um, the Commission said at a very, very early stage it would be open to membership uh, from the member states of the energy community area, so Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Serbia, etc. And it's in fact in that area that there's a lot of interest, and it's not surprising maybe uh, why that is so, as obviously they're very vulnerable. So it's an idea that's certainly resonating in that part of the world. So we don't know much about the form, but we do know a little bit about the objectives, although that's a bit of a moving target too. Um, in the early communications, it was um, hinted or it was expressed that um, this, um, this platform would be a sort of EU-wide single, single buyer. Um, now, if those of you who followed the early years of EU electricity law can remember, uh, we have single buyers back in that, state, uh, that time uh, to manage uh, electricity capacity. Um, but here then it would be a single buyer buying uh, gas from Russia. So the idea would be to, to confront uh, the monopolist uh, seller with a monopsony um, so that uh, we would get better, a better deal. Now, of course, Russia has played its hand and has come up with all sorts of ways to use gas as um, you could say, an instrument of warfare um, and the EU's maybe always been a bit on the back foot. Um, but was this joint platform going to just focus on gas, natural gas, and was it just going to focus on Russia? Well, probably not. I mean, we've already had the agreement with the US, uh, but there are other gas suppliers, of course, um, Norway, uh, Qatar being also a very important uh, source of LNG. Uh, and then, you know, moving forward with this platform, start negotiating purchases of renewable gas, uh, hydrogen. The, so it wouldn't be just an emergency short-term crisis measure, but it would grow into something that would be part then of the EU institutional landscape. Now, there's also been a discussion about what do we do, um, especially if we're looking at natural gas, what do we do about existing contracts? Many countries do have long-term contracts for gas supply. Uh, some of those contracts have been expiring quite recently, um, or they will expire towards the end of this year. But there's been a big discussion as to whether or not uh, you could break up or break open those contracts and let this joint purchasing platform, whatever it might be, uh, take over. And I think the legal dominant legal opinion there is bad idea. Um, so uh, that is probably um, the reason why in most of the communications so far, the Commission has indicated that we'll be looking at new sources of gas and um, where possible trying to conclude new contracts when existing contracts for natural gas expire. So at this stage, maybe some questions, because um, we don't, I don't know the answers. Uh, but for competition law, uh, aficionados and competition economists, they're very important questions. And we're going to be looking at them through the course of, of the, the event today. So do we know who is going to be a member of this platform? Now, sometimes it seems that it will be member state representatives, state actors then. And if you set then the platform up as a, a state entity in the sense that it's a bunch of, of government representatives, who are going to organize the buying of the gas, would that matter from a competition um, law point of view? Would the fact that this is a state entity, like uh, we have, we do have some precedents, Eurocontrol, who controls uh, air safety, um, is a state-backed entity that's comprised of representatives from the member states. And there has been some competition law type uh, discussion about whether or not Europol um, has to, Eurocontrol, sorry, has to comply with state aid law. Um, but what was most important in that case was not so much the form of, of the organization, but the nature of its activities. And they were deemed to be non-economic because it was dealing with air safety control. 
Now, whether or not a, a form of state representative backed single buyer for gas would be deemed to be dealing uh, in the market in a non-economic way, I think that would take a bit of a stretch um, of even a legal imagination. Um, and another aspect, of course, to bear in mind is that this single buyer in the way it seems to be conceived at the moment is not just buying the gas in jointly uh, on behalf of the, the membership, the voluntary membership of countries, but it will arrange selling it on, selling it downstream. And there we have another problem um, from European energy uh, law and competition law, because if you are selling downstream, can you say to um, your LNG exporter, let's say Katergas, uh, you can only supply, we can only do an agreement with you to deliver that gas and supply that gas to Poland. And Poland is not allowed to sell it on at great profit, of course, to let's say the Czech Republic. That's called a destination clause. And we know we don't like them in competition law. And in fact, our favorite Russian gas supplier was told to get rid of those destination clauses. So that could be an issue too, that could be a question. And I have some more questions I'll just run through uh, and we'll pick them up. Um, and this is one ma major question, of course, is the scope of this, the state immunity doctrine. So to what extent, if we have private companies or commercial actors joining into the activities of the platform, can they claim that they are being mandated by the EU to perform certain functions and therefore they're immune from antitrust sanctions, whether they're EU law, antitrust sanctions or US or whatever. Um, now, this raises difficulties, of course, um, because of the state immunity doctrine is a very complex one. Uh, and the, the extent to which you can claim protection is rather fluid to say the least. Uh, but what makes it even more complicated in this case is that the purchasing platform is voluntary. It's not mandatory. So if you voluntary as, as let's say Shell or Equinor or whatever, join the platform, uh, can you claim that you're um, in fact being compelled by the state to do these things in any event? Um, so that's a question. And again, looking back at precedent, um, <clears throat> the GFU was, of course, also at a certain point in time, at least a state-backed uh, cartel. And the commission at the time did not accept that uh, the members of that cartel could rely on the state immunity doctrine, although they were able to sort of massage it a bit uh, when it came to the remedies in the settlement. But Gazprom, the more recent settlements with Gazprom, um, again, suggests that uh, this is a very difficult doctrine to invoke for commercial entities and to rely on. So that, again, is a big question mark. Now, I'll just end very quickly uh, with some options, um, because I think it's always, as a lawyer, it's really easy to say you can't do something. That tends to be our sort of default line. Um, but it's also a challenge to try and think, well, what could you do? Is there something that we really could do um, and avoid the pitfalls of competition law? And quite a few people are looking to what, at what's been going on in the hydrogen field. Uh, and there is quite an interesting example of what seems to be allowed in Germany. And I say seems because I haven't seen any official competition clearance. Um, but what we do know is that it's been cleared. This arrangement has been cleared for state aid purposes by the commission. Uh, unfortunately, the, the decision is not yet published. It's only a press, press release. But from looking at the website of this H2 Global, um, mechanism that has been set up to buy and sell um, hydrogen, new hydrogen supplies in Germany, you can see that it might be possible um, to set up a platform that supports anonymous trading and clearing. So it's centralizing seller and buyer facilities, it's supporting competition, it's not making the decisions itself, it's setting up two-sided auctions, for example, um, so it's allowing sellers and buyers access 
if you like, to a platform where they can match their offers. And the platform itself doesn't exercise any market power. Now, as I mentioned, it has been approved by uh, DG Comp um, as, as a state aid measure. Uh, but normally, of course, under state aid law, you're not allowed to give approval uh, for something that would infringe another part of EU law. Um, interesting, the, the, the platform idea that we've been looking at in the context of the, the Burgle paper I mentioned, which will be published, I hope, next week, um, is would, we would be looking primarily at LNG and trying to work out, well, would this be a good way of trying to match offers um, and buyers uh, for LNG purchases. So sort of starting off experimenting with one form of, of gas. And there are various ways of trying to make sure that you don't distort competition too much, because obviously um, you're introducing a mechanism that would have to co coexist alongside current sales arrangements. Uh, so the idea would be to try to understand where are we missing volumes in the EU and how could we compensate when the normal market forces are not working? So this is something that is being developed um, and might be a solution, but I'd be really interested to hear the views of the economists and others working in the area as to whether or not that would be a good idea. Um, another option to centralize would not just be the, the to match um, buy, buyers' offers and sellers' offers, but you could actually you could actually combine a lot of logistical information, which will be very important um, because you could help then um, the member states and, and terminal operators, LNG terminal operators, gas TSOs, to make sure that the proposed volumes are actually physically deliverable. So you know where the bottlenecks are in the system. Uh, you can avoid unexpected costs that are, might arise through those bottlenecks. So you could coordinate a lot of logistical information as well through that platform, which might make it um, actually uh, much more functional and, and attractive. And this we see actually as an essential added value of the platform. So that's um, my sort of setting the scene. And I think Ignacio, I've asked lots of questions and you're a good person to start thinking about the answer. Yes. So thank you so much, Dave, for that presentation. And we move straight ahead to the second speaker. That's going to be me. This is a little bit rude because normally the moderator does not speak, but I mean, we are among mostly friends. Bentula, very nice to see you, by the way. I see you here. <laughs> he was here visiting us in Bergen not that long ago. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing here. So we share the next slides. And then uh, just give me a second. Yes. And then I'll share the screen again. Here you go. I hope you're seeing my screen now. I think that is the case. I, at least we see it here. So my name is Ignacio Herrera Anchustegui. I am an associate professor at the University of Bergen, and I've been working with buyer power issues for a good part of my life. Uh, I'm not that old, uh, but my six years or five years of my life were dedicated to buyer power. So it's a rare happening that I can combine buyer power with energy that are really my two main interests. And, and it is a rare happening because of this thing that is going on here. And this is where I think Lee left it and I am picking it up. The reality is that gas is really expensive. That's it. Gas has become incredibly expensive and it went from about three US dollars, the cubic meter in the Henry hub to 9.36. So that is an increase of 300% in two years. And that is creating a crisis when it comes to energy prices overall. And this coin also with other issues is asking governments, decision makers, companies and end users, what are we gonna do with this? So this is the reality and it is making absolutely everything more expensive, including flights or even your electricity bill or things more simple like inflation is becoming double digit for the first time in most European countries in a few decades. Uh, it is expected to continue being increasing. And because of this, the European Commission, and I will be briefly here, 
has decided to try to tackle an idea of doing joint purchasing. And this is done through Repower EU and the energy platform Task Force, in which they want to aggregate demand. So they want to aggregate buyers with a way to negotiate in a better way energy supplies. As Lee was saying, this is in principle geared towards gas, but there's also the idea to extend that also to hydrogen. And the joint purchasing mechanism is connected to the EU external energy strategy. So in a way to depend less on import, imports of energy and particularly gas, we know 40% plus comes from Russia. And what we see is now that it's being currently discussed. And the, as Lee was mentioning, this is purchases on behalf of states. This is what is on the agenda now, but as I'll mention later on, things are starting to change. And then we are seeing already initiatives to extend it to private actors. And this is not only, for example, from private entities, but also from governments that are suggesting this. And the idea also is, as I mentioned, is to extend it to hydrogen to create perhaps a market for a new energy carrier, energy source that is very important, but it requires demand. So this would be a good way, I think, to create demand. As far as I understood, the gossip in Brussels says that it will be operating already in the winter and the electricity prices and the gas prices are not likely to go down. And therefore, this might be a good political move, if you want to call it a little bit like this. And it's not coming out of nowhere. I mean, we Lee already mentioned the joint uh, single buyer entity that we have had in the directives, the directives of electricity of 1996, for example, uh, for purchasing also access to the grid. But we, we see that very recently, and unfortunately, we have the joint purchasing program for vaccines for COVID. Uh, and this is used as an example of public procurement that is done here. And uh, this is not exactly public procurement, but it's somewhat connected to it. So I'll talk a little bit about 101. So the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, biocartels and joint purchasing alliances, which in reality is what kind of instruments is this and can it be under EU competition law? And we know purchasing agreements can be under Article 101 scope. They are indeed in it. And it could be either a problem or it could be actually something that fosters economic efficiency and could be uh, positive for humanity and in society in, in general. And they are going to be assessed under the horizontal agreement guidelines that are currently being reviewed. And I must say that when I was preparing the presentation, the review for joint purchasing agreements is serious. And I think it's a very positive. It's much more detailed, it's much more nuanced, much more interesting than what it was in the previous document. And it, it interestingly puts a lot of things on how this joint purchasing mechanism might do. And a, a purchasing agreement in general can take many forms and the purchasing alliance that has been proposed for energy, it might be a joint venture. Graham was asking something about this in the chat and we will go back to it at the end. It could be a company that is not controlled by any entity or it could be a cooperative or a contractual arrangement. And in the case of the joint purchasing mechanism, it is either a joint venture or an entity that will work in a contractual arrangement. That is what is being discussed. Monica will speak about joint venture later on and what are the advantages of doing with them. And a joint purchasing is not only about buying, but it's also about other things, uh, in particular joint distribution. And here in the case of energy, we have the problem of who will receive the energy and we earmarking the purchases and is, are these destination clauses? It's about quality control, but we're buying gas. Gas is the same everywhere, no matter where it comes from. It's, it's, chemic, it's chemistry, is nothing else. And we also want to try to avoid delivery costs and duplication of them through this alliance. Uh, they might be used whatever you're acquired to own consumption or resale. And in the case of reselling, then competition issues become bigger. And in the case of own consumption, then you might start wondering, is this actually an economic activity? And if it's not an economic activity, it can fall out of Article 101 because of Fenning case. And it's obviously geared to the creation of buyer power. Something that I think is interesting and good in the guidelines that are being revised is that it very clearly states that this is an effect upstream, in this case, against the sellers of gas, but also downstream, in this case, between the buyers of gas, but also horizontally and vertically. This is something that was not very present in the guidelines before. So let's talk about the bad part. Biocartel, very easy. It fixes prices. You cannot do that. That's not allowed. And you cannot set quotas. That's not allowed. And you cannot divide markets. That's not allowed. There's case law on this, on joint purchasing. 
The cases are relatively old, but we know it's pretty obvious that this is a naked restriction of competition, as they will call it in the US. And in the, the idea here is you coordinate behavior upstream, but also downstream, because you want to eliminate competition between buyers acting as a retailer later on. And therefore, exchange of information is seen as a big problem here. And even if they might be positive in terms of reducing price, they're going to be prohibited for two reasons. First, they are going to create inefficiency if it's a buyer cartel, re reduces the quantity that is purchased. Uh, Lars is going to speak about this, this is monopsony theory 101. And in addition to that, it's just cheating. You are changing the way that prices are formed, and we don't want that. That's something that competition law is also about. On the other hand, a buying alliance or a joint procurement mechanism, it is actually pro-competitive most of the time. And the European Commission in the revised guidelines that are now being out, but they, you can no longer send any comments. They're telling us that they're positive because they lower end prices, increase output and quality or innovation, as long as they're, and I quote the document, limited to what is objective necessary to ensure that you're exerting buying power in relation to your suppliers. But uh, the Commission has a positive outlook, which I agree to in what I've done with buyer power. And it is about collective activity and your members need to bind by the rules that exist. And those rules typically will have to come in a pre-arranged agreement. And that cannot include any aspects that look like a cartel. And what the European Commission is saying here already is you need to organize yourself and you need to follow the rules that you do, but you cannot go too far. And the joint purchasing mechanism, I'll talk a little bit about that, is based on the idea of a buying alliance. Well, that's what I, the intuition that I get. So what are the differences between these two instruments? Well, very easily, a buyer cartel is bad. And it's, if it's a buyer's cartel where you fix prices or quotas, that is 99.9% .9 of the time, it's going to be an object restriction, and you won't be able to have any efficiencies on it, even if you decrease the purchasing price because it's going to be a monopsony effect, and also because you simply cannot do that. You cannot fix prices. Whereas a buying alliance is about coordination, but it remains independent, the activities of the users of the good that you have purchased. And it, very importantly, the purchasing has to be made, in the case law we have seen, by an independent agent that acts independently on, on behalf of the alliance, but without creating exchange of information between them. And also, as long as you don't with the withhold demand, because then you will be acting like a monopsonist would do. And that is, that is not a good thing in economic terms, but we, we will hear more about that. So very quickly on case law, I, I can tell you that buyer cartels are bad. And the commission has said it a few times. Uh, I just have two cases here about tobacco, because I don't smoke, but I think it's an interesting case because there were seller cartels against buyer cartels. So cartel against cartel or monopsony against a monopoly that is called a mono emporist, if I'm not mistaken. And that is could be the situation if there's a European buyer cartel against Russia. Then you will have a monopolist against a monopsonist looking at each other. And this is what happened in Raw Tobacco, Spain. And in Raw Tobacco, Italy, both of them fixed prices, but also fixed quotas. How much are we going to buy? And the, the, the European Commission said, you cannot do that. In the US, they also did the same. In this case, it was about macaroni, how much grain your pasta needs to have. And there was a, a, a decision that we're not going to buy more than X percent. And we're not going to buy it in a particular way. And that was considered to be a per se infringement of US competition law, uh, US antitrust. Buying alliances, on the other hand, there are two cases that are interesting to look at. Sulfuric Acid Association, classical case of buyer power, in which centralized purchasing was actually seen as pro-competitive and exempted under Article 101.3 because it complied with the requirements. And it was only discussed if this could be an effect-based restriction. And here is where the commission's point about having an agent that purchases on behalf of others is coming from. This is a case from the 80s, but it was the starting point of how you do joint purchasing. So you can have a central committee that decides on behalf of everybody, but does not exchange information. And then there's another case. Uh, I, I focus on the Dutch case. This Dutch case was about cheese. And in this case, the decision was that the joint purchasing was illegal because you were not allowed to buy outside of the joint purchasing scheme. So you were forced to only buy in the joint purchasing scheme. And this was for purchasing rennet, which is something that you use for making cheese. 
Uh, I said some years ago that it was for making cheese yellow, but that's not true. Uh, some, a cheese lover told me that is incorrect. But in this case, if you were not allowed to only buy through the, uh, the commission here. So let's look a little bit about this, and I have a few more minutes to go. I hope that it's okay. We're sticking pretty well on time. Let's talk about a joint purchasing mechanism. I honestly think that as far as we're looking at, the Commission and the European Union is trying to create it as much as possible as a purchasing alliance and not a cartel. And I will say a little bit about this, uh, but I'll be trying to also raise some issues. Some of them are similar to the ones that Lee has raised. Some of them will be replicated also by Monica because it seems like we are thinking alike and we have not organized so much. We didn't have a cartel of presenters, but yeah, we see similar problems uh, and I will mention some of them. So the first thing is that it's voluntary and it's voluntary and it should be voluntary. Uh, and that is one of the reasons for this is the case law that we have had. The, the Dutch case that I was mentioning is an example of it. There's a Danish case also from the early 90s, that it was also a discussion on whether it's voluntary or not being a part of a purchasing alliance. And it is going to be on behalf of member states. And here, I think, besides the point that Lee was making, another issue that it could be interesting is whether you can separate the purchases between purchases that are for economic activity and purchases that are outside of an economic activity because they are for functions of the state and therefore they would be excluded from the application of Article 101. How to do this is gonna be very difficult, but it, it could be a potential exit here. So you have two sets. So one of them qualifies an economic activity because you conduct economic activity with the gas that you have purchased and another one will be outside of it. That's for, for competition law issues. And the idea with the joint purchasing is to aggregate demand and competitive release gas to the market. So that's what you would like to focus. And as I mentioned before, it has been proposed that it works as a joint venture. And I'm guessing here is probably to get some kind of pre-approval because you will work it out as a, some kind of merger perhaps, or you will run a business owned entity. The commission uh, has said that this is supposed to be subject to competition law rules and a review. So I'm suspecting that the review is gonna be ex ante and not ex post because that's how I understand review. Interestingly, and Lee also mentioned it, is going to spread to non-EU member states, and the Energy Community Secretariat is going to be the main beneficiary of it. In the case of Norway, which is where we are broadcasting from, is actually maybe not a good idea for us. We will be the ones that are facing the cartel, because we sell 25% of the gas to Europe, and it's about 99% of the gas that is extracted in this country it goes to the continent because we don't use gas. I tried to buy a house some years ago and my priority was a gas kitchen, that it's impossible to get a gas kitchen in this country. Uh, so how can it work in practice? Well, it will work in practice based on the EU energy platform and they will identify and aggregate gas demand and volumes and they will take into account long-term contracts. What's gonna happen with those long-term contracts with Russia, we, we, we don't know yet. And this is a big discussion and it will be probably a lot of issues of investors' uh, claims. In addition to that, the platform is supposed to use transparent use of import, storage, and transmission gas infrastructure. So you're exchanging information in a way to make sure that you distribute properly the gas that you're utilizing, but also the infrastructure connected to it. And it will also utilize an IT mechanism to promote transparency in bookings. So you want to talk about capacity, rerouting, and secondary markets. When you start looking at this, then we start thinking, is this starting to become a little bit like a destination clause or is a little bit of market sharing? How is this going to be done in light of the case law that we have? And this is where it becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, some food for thought, a couple more, two more slides and I'm finishing now. The first one is, as mentioned already by Lee, is the state action doctrine, but also connection to breach of long-term contracts. But a um, person much smarter than me also suggested recently, this should be maybe extended to private bodies too. So private bodies will be commercial undertakings. And this was Mario Draghi. Uh, yeah, everybody knows him. Has been a president of the European Central Bank and is the current president of Italy, if I'm not mistaken, or prime minister. And his suggestion was this should be extended. And that suggestion was two weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, in addition to this, is the distribution of purchase gas, the destination clauses that Lee has mentioned already. These are the Gazprom cases from 2014, 15 in Eastern Europe, if I'm not mistaken. 
Bulgaria, Romania, uh, and where the, the commission said, you have to stop, you, this has to be eliminated. And therefore, if you do it, we give you, we give you a possibility to not get a fine with this. Another issue that has been discussed is this cartel might be difficult to realize because there are so many sellers as well. There's not only one or two, there are about 30. Of course, the most important ones for Europe are going to be um, Russia and Norway, but in, we're not talking about only one company, one state. That's the case of Gazprom, but there are more companies than selling. And this is something that is, uh, has been criticized. And a, a few other things is, yeah, voluntary is good, and it should be only voluntary, I think. But at the same time, because it's voluntary, it will create a lot of problems of stability of the alliance. And here I think that sellers are going to start playing off people, and then we will be start testing again who is actually very European or maybe less European. And maybe we get some prisoner dilemmas issues in which I get in a lot from being outside of the alliance and then the alliance becomes defeated. So it is a situation in which if we're going to do it, everybody has to go in it. And if we're not going to do it, then you have these issues of, of aspects. And something that will be also touched upon by Monica is Eurogas, which is uh, an entity that groups energy and gas companies, the biggest ones, including Equinor, for example, here in Norway, uh, they are very critical to this mechanism. So they are saying this should be the last resort. It, it also, it has to be exempted completely out of competition law in their perspective. So competition law has to have no say about this, a particular exclusion on it. And it should include also market actors. So it connects with what Draghi was mentioning. And it was about this issue of, do we actually have buyers that we can squeeze? Is there enough gas in the world to negotiate? or the gas, it is already tied in long-term agreements, power purchasing agreements, and is there that much liquidity in the market? So with this being said, I'll stop here my presentation, and then I will ask uh, Lash Sorgar, uh, who is the director of the Bergen Center for Competition Law and Economics and former director of the Norwegian um, uh, Competition Authority to come to the floor. Lash, I'm gonna set up here your slides. But I'm going to make sure that people are seeing it. There we go. Share the screen. So, Lars, thank you so much for joining us. And since we don't have COVID anymore, which is good, we can do these sort of things. I change the mic and I give it to you. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining. And the floor is all yours. Let's see. Thank you, Ignacio. Thank you for the invitation. So nice to be here, and uh, it's an important topic. Uh, so let's see. I'm gonna talk from an economist perspective. So, but I listen to the, those two speakers. First speakers is uh, yeah, many similarities. So I, I don't think we disagree on uh, seriously on many points. But uh, on the other hand, uh, let me see it from the outside. So. I'm not an expert on the gas market, so I'm coming from the outside anyway. Uh, uh, so I will discuss the economics of joint purchasing, and I interpret, uh, interpret uh, joint purchasing as increased buyer power. Uh, and uh, you both touch upon uh, cartel versus buyer power versus joint purchasing. There are some. Uh, uh, thin lines between those uh, cases, so we have to think about what is what is it, this exactly. So I'm going to talk first about the effect of buyer power versus seller power. Mention seller power very briefly, and uh, then ask the question: when, sh why, when and why should we be concerned about some kind of buyer power? I'm not touching upon competition though, because that's been uh, been covered very good so far. Uh, and it's not so much about Norway, uh, more about uh, the function of the market, and uh, hopefully it's about the function of the market for gas in Europe. So let's see. First, let's think about buyer power versus seller power. Traditionally, if you speak to economists, they are normally more concerned about seller power than buyer power. Uh, so seller power is just to fix prices to, 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 to buyers. Uh, then can, that can lead to higher prices to buyers and consumers. Uh, and uh, you mentioned uh, Lee, the, the GFU, uh, Gas for Handling I think that's the Norwegian name. And uh, that's a good example of seller power and joint selling. And we should be concerned about that. So that was a big case 
it must be 20 years ago, I can't remember exactly, but it was a big case. And I understand very well why the European Commission was concerned about that kind of uh, organization, because they have joined, the, the sellers joined forces and had a, had a coordinated body anyway. So that was problematic. On the other hand, buyer power is on the other side of the market in a way, or the, on the other side of the table. Uh, buyer power can imply that input prices are reduced, and then it can also be passed on to consumers or other uh, downstream, downstream uh, uh, buyers if they, are, they sell to others. And I think this is also in line with the broad picture when we look at competition law. Uh, Ignacio talked about so buyer cartel as something problematic, but then you said joint purchase, that could be a very good proof competitive. And that's, uh, I think it's uh, more in line with the economist view. But there are some discussion uh, recently, for example, a labor market, which is uh, about uh, firms using buyer power in the labor market and how they should uh, intervene against that uh, using antitrust law. That's a big discussion in the US, but I'm, I'll not touch upon that one. Uh, first, uh, the, and the most obvious thing I would say, it can be beneficial with buyer power, both for consumers and for the society as a whole. The reason is that the buyer can trigger competition between the sellers, which can lead to lower input prices. So in a way, this is uh, this in a way triggering competition, not uh, uh, destroying competition in a way. Uh, and think about markets where we have very high concentration upstream. The suppliers are few. They have a large uh, uh, market power, seller power. They can set high prices. And then you might need some countervailing uh, buyer power. So if the buyers then have the power to intervene one way or another, they could uh, force the prices to become even lower. So you, you could, for example, if there, are, if there are two sellers upstream, two suppliers, and then you have several buyers, they join forces, the buyers, and so they jointly ask those two to bid for selling to them, this joint entity. That's buyer power in, in practice. That's joint purchase where you trigger competition between two upstream sellers, which uh, at the outset had a very strong position. Uh, so by going from buyer power, you have a large buyer, to joint forces to uh, joint purchase, then you can have even more buyer power. So that's, uh, that's could be an argument for having joint purchase. And I think it's aligned with what uh, Ignacio said also. One example from Norway, Joint purchase, uh, it might lead to lower prices. Uh, for Norwegian, you know there are two uh, nationwide TV channels. Uh, there, are, there are more, but two, the most important one, I would say, TV2 and NRK. They joined forces, and it was a bid for the TV rights for the European Championship in soccer until 2028. So TV2 and NRK, they won this contract jointly. So they, in, a way, it's a, in a way, it's a joint purchase where they then probably, I don't know, probably get a much lower price uh, in this scenario than if TV2 and Anarchy then competed on this contract. So this thing, yes, I think that's an example where we have a very strong seller. You can discuss whether it is, uh, it's a monopoly or what it is, but it's a, it's a European championship and the TV rights. And then you have some buyers in Norway, and they want, both of them want to have this on their screen, and then they join forces, and probably they got a lower price. Another example, uh, this is also in the TV market, where we had some years ago, two providers of uh, satellite uh, TV uh, signals uh, in Norway, Viasat and Canal Digital, or it's changed, but it was in, the, in 2008. They had, in a way, uh, some kind of exclusive distribution of several TV channels. For example, uh, TV2, which I just mentioned, was only on one of them, Canal Digital. And that was, could also be some kind of buyer power from uh, uh, Canal Digital to, or the other. So it's only on one of them. So what happened then in, uh, in, in, after March 2008, it was an agreement between Viasat and Canal Digital, those two providers. Uh, TV2 should not be exclusive anymore, should be on both, uh, pro, for, for both providers. 
and was some kind of swap of several channels. So you get all the channels on both platforms or both uh, providers. And this could have been a case because this is an agreement between competitors. And, but it's an agreement on, on how they behave in the upstream market. So it's a way, it's, it's, it's some kind of joint, uh, not purchase, but uh, agreement on what, how to behave in the input market. So you can argue that, uh, let's see there. In one way, it's broader and better content to each consumer because if you are on either via sat or Canal Digital, you get all the, suddenly you get all, all the TV channels. That's a good thing for the consumers. And those two providers become more similar, which means that uh, uh, they are closer uh, rivals. I mean, they're closer rivals, we expect them to compete tougher in the marketplace. So in a way, this is good news for the consumers. Uh, and it's an agreement between competitors, but it, it's about how they behave uh, uh, when it relates to the in input market. So this shows that there can be some good things about buyer power uh, and joint action by the, by the firms that are at the OSA uh, rivals. But as uh, mentioned by Lee and also by uh, Ignacio, we also have to think about uh, what's, the, what's the harm from joint purchase. And Lee, you mentioned the monopsony in the Rus case of Russia, for example. That's the traditional model. I think uh, many lawyers uh, refer to that model, uh, monopsony model. It's quite extreme in a way, because it says that you restrict your input quantity in order to get a lower input price. So in a way, it's with, you withhold uh, uh, demand in order to set a lower price, to, ha to, to have a lower, lower price. So if you have a lower input quantity, that leads to lower output also. So the problem is then that you get a lower input price, that means uh, you buy less. When you buy less, you also sell less. So if you have also uh, not only lower input prices, uh, you also have higher output prices because uh, uh, the, the quantity is lower and then the rule of supply and demand, lower quantity leads to higher price to the, to the end users. So then it's a harm to consumers and harm to suppliers. And this is the example of a buyer cartel, you can, for example, be, as uh, Ignacio talked about. And often these example here is uh, referred to as the, in natural resource industry. There are many assumptions to be made for this to work. For example, you have to have so-called increasing cost of production. Uh, that means that uh, for each new, uh, unit you put into production, it's more expensive. Then you have this uh, upward, sl upward sloping uh, supply curve, and then you have something called marginal expenditure. This could be in a gas production relevant in a way, because if it is so that to get more gas into the market, it's more and more expensive. So in that way, it could be relevant to use this model. But for other reasons, it's not so relevant. I'll come back to that. Then the other one is, um, harm from joint purchasing, that's more, think about oligopoly. That means uh, you have a few firms in the industry. Uh, it's not a monopoly. There's uh, two or three or four. Uh, then you have some buyers, then negotiate with suppliers, uh, among, other, among other things on price. Then you have some complex contracts between supplier and buyer. Uh, and in, my, in, uh, in many respects, in many industries, this is what we, observe uh, that there is a negotiation going on, uh, a few players upstream, few players downstream. So this kind of model uh, of oligopoly, it's more fitted to the situation than, than this monopsy model, maybe. Then you also often assume that the buyers sell their product in the same market. Uh, the problem then, as uh, Ignacia just briefly touched upon, is that if joint purchase then it might spill over on the competition in the downstream market. Uh, you learn about each other's input costs in one way or another. Uh, you have, an, for example, internal pricing systems so that they all face higher input prices when they set final prices. You can have a system of like that. So then if that's true, then they set higher prices to consumers, even though they have jointly purchasing at a lower price. So you can get a, in a way, the same problem as with a monopsy model. At, okay, you, you might succeed with, with uh, lower input prices, but uh, this, that, this uh, market power of these oligopoly firms spill over to the don't see market, then you get higher prices, even if you have lower input, pri input prices. So that's a potential problem. 
I'll come back to the gas market, whether this is relevant or not. So one example of this, you mentioned some example, uh, Ignacia. Yeah, this is a Norwegian one from the grocery sector. There was a company called Ica in Norway. Now it's out of the market. And Norges Köpen is still there, as the Norwegian know very well. Uh, in 2013, four retail chains, we had four retail chains in Norway, uh, in Norwegian grocery market. And it was also high concentration among suppliers. Uh, uh, in Norway, we have, for example, production of milk. You have one producer having 85% market share. So it's, it's very high concentration on, a, on the upstream level. So it could be quite okay with the countervailing buyer power to lowering input price because you have so strong position for the suppliers. But then the question is, is it beneficial with a joint purchase purchase here? And uh, this was a case which was looked into by the Innovation Competition Authority before I joined. So they didn't have anything to do with that case. Uh, they then banned this joint purchase. It was an interim measure. That means that before they have gone really into the details, that this is this is not legal. So stop, and then they do the uh, more detailed uh, decision afterwards. So one theory of harm was the following: uh, by having this uh, uh, buyer alliance, as they call it, uh, then you join forces uh, in the input market. That could be fine. But the problem is that you also join forces to, in setting prices to the to the shops. So uh, by setting the right prices for you to the shops, then you can uh, level the prices to the consumers. So this is a problem spit where you have a spillover to the downstream market, to the end users, because of this cooperation in it, which is uh, should be in the input market, but it spillovers to the output, to the to the final consumers. So this was. Um, the end of the story was that uh, ICA was uh, acquired. This was uh, didn't go through, so they uh, annulled it, and then uh, Coop uh, acquired ICA later on. So that's another story. Okay, let's go back to gas. Is joint purchase in gas beneficial? Well, in one way, you can say that this looks uh, reasonable. Uh, there are few suppliers of gas, uh, Russia, Norway, some others. So in th this, we talk about this upstream uh, market. It's a lot of market power because there are few sellers. Uh, by joining forces, the buyers will not compete for gas deliveries. Then it can ensure lower enterprise. So in theory, it could be good. So in one way, it's parallel to this joint purchase of, for example, TV rights, but it's not in another way, it's not. Because uh, if you look at the TV rights, it's either you win, or you lose everything. So you get one or zero. So you win or lose, that's really tough competition. Here you don't, that, this is not the case. Here is that everybody needs gas. So it's not that I can just uh, trigger competition and then have, a, have a, some uh, different situation. Now we need all gas in Netherlands, Germany, France. So it's not the same. So then you have not the same power from joining forces as you had in the TV rights market, where you could in a way really be much stronger when you say, oh no, it's not, at, uh, it's not zero one for each of us. No, we will have it jointly. So, and then the European championship with the TV right has a problem because, okay, okay, we have to sell to them. So there's no competition here actually. So this is very different actually. So if you think about monopsony power, that was mentioned, then it can be even worse for gas users. Uh, if, you, if you believe in the story of the monopsy model, then you should withhold demand, withhold demand. You should reduce quantity bought. By you doing that, you, you force down the input price. But the problem is if you reduce the quantity bought, you also reduce the quantity you sell in the marketplace at the end of the day. And, we, and if you have a lower quantity to sell in the marketplace, then the market clearing price should go up. So that's the problem. If you try to think about Russia, monopsony power, well, you harm yourself in a way by doing that. By reducing quantities uh, bought from Russia, then we have less to uh, sell in, in Europe of gas, and less to sell in, uh, of gas in Europe leads to higher prices. So you have to be careful with that. Uh, and I think this model also not really fit the situation because in reality there was some there will be some negotiation uh, on input prices not a monopsy model so in a way it's not that europe 
decide to buy less. I don't believe in that story. I think it's more like they have some negotiation and this is by the input price. So then we are back to this oligopoly model more, more than a monopsy model. So if you think about that, uh, they, if oligopoly and negotiation, then the risk of spillover to prices for guest users is something we have to think about. And this is really about uh, the details of the contracts. And the devils are in the details. So you have some good ideas about this platform, trying to, to, to monitor it and everything. So that sounds good. Uh, uh, anyway, in that case, they negotiate on input prices and not quantity set by the buyer as in the monopsy model. That sounds right, right? If buyers sell in the same market, then it can be a spillover to prices for final users, as I said before. Uh, it might be lower input prices, but no guarantee that it leads to lower prices to final gas users. And uh, one thing in, in the Norwegian case in, in the grocery market was about this input price coordination. But as you mentioned, this market sharing device, this destination clause, that could be another mechanism which harms final consumers. So there, you have to be very careful in the nitty gritty details on that uh, contract. And I uh, said that, okay, you said it's important, it's voluntary. I don't really see the point. What if all of them agreed to, to join? If we had a seller cartel, for example, and we say, oh, this is fine because it's voluntary. We'll never uh, uh, accept that because uh, they, they join the cartel if it's good for them. If it's good for them, it could be harmful for consumers. So we, the voluntary is not a good, principle in my view. So I think we need a detailed monitoring system to avoid such a spillover effect. And we had some ideas. I haven't seen that in detail, but uh, is it also in some cases that it's not so easy to monitor? So uh, you can't monitor it properly because the underlying incentives for the firms, if they are involved, is they want to, to earn money. So how do you then keep those incentives in, in in place, so we don't pop out and it leads to higher prices. So in you, you have to have, you are not on the same, you're not working with the firms, you're working against the firms because the firms has another agenda than you. So you have to be very careful with the monitor, I would say. Then I'll uh, just uh, try to conclude. From my perspective, as an economist, I'm not into competition law now today, it's not obvious how joint purchase will affect the market. Might lead to lower input prices, uh, could be. Uh, but will it, despite this, lead to higher final prices? I have to, you have to think very carefully about the monitoring system and how do you, how do you in a way, establish that platform. And uh, Ali had some good ideas uh, uh, about that. That's good, but uh, I think you have to think very carefully through this because there are some loopholes, I think, we have to be aware of. And if there's an incentives there to, to earn more money, they will pop up and they will, they will go around the system easily. But is it such that we are on a capacity constraint? Small changes, chances for more gas? Is this a structural problem in the market? It's an undersupply, as was mentioned by Ignacio in his last slide. Then what is then the, the room for action here? Cutting input prices will not lead to more gas supply in near or medium term future. So the quantity of gas is so difficult to increase uh, and we don't want to reduce it because that leads to higher prices. So what, 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 is, the, what is the room of action here? Okay. To clear the market for end users, the price then will still have to be high. If, the quant if you can't increase quantity and we don't want to reduce quantity to use monopsony power, then we are stuck with the same quantity and how can we then have a lower price to end users? I don't see that. So that's my last point. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lars. And now we will be moving to the digital world. Monica, we have you here with us. I'll stop sharing. Monica is joining us from Oslo, and she Hello. is a partner in the, uni in the, the university, in the law firm Hjert. And Monica, it's a great pleasure to have you with us here today. Monica has been working on competition law issues for many years, and she is an expert. If I'm not mistaken, Monica, you work quite a lot on telecom. 
which in a way is not very different from what is going on in, elect in electricity or in gas markets because it's a network sort of industry. And you have also a lot of experience when it comes to the more practical issues of it. And that is why you're going to be talking to us about the practical considerations here. We're seeing your screen here in full size. And That's Monica, good. thank you so much again for joining us. The floor is all yours and you have some 20 minutes to present your ideas and then we will have a discussion. We have had quite a lot of questions in the chat. So we will take those and thank you so much for posting them. And Monica, thank you again for being with us. The floor is all yours. Thank you. Uh, hello everybody. Um, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I was requested to give um, the perspective of a more practicing lawyer to this, um, to this issue. Uh, as Ignacio said, I've been working very much, uh, I've been working as a competition lawyer for about 20, 25 years now. And I've been working a lot on telecoms, a lot on media markets. I'm very interesting to see that Lars was using <laughs> some of my cases as, as examples uh, earlier on. Um, uh, but I've also been working on, on energy markets with, and with energy companies uh, on, on this uh, for, for, from a competition law perspective. So this is kind of, as a practitioner lawyer, how would I go about and, and try to analyze the situation? Um, obviously, as we all know, um, let me see. Um, just make sure that I can. Um, did I change the page now? Yeah. Um, actually, what the European Union is planning is at least to my, uh, in my opinion, still a bit unclear. Uh, the communication we've seen so far is talking about some form of joint uh, purchasing mechanism and how it, it, it will actually be formed is, is still quite unclear. And I think the first question would be actually who will be doing the actual purchasing? I mean, will it be the member states as such, such as we had under the vaccine, uh, the joint uh, COVID vaccine purchasing? Um, and if so, will they then be carrying out an economic activity or will they be performing a task in the public interest? Um, it's, it's, uh, I would assume that they would be uh, performing an economic activity so that competition law in principle would apply. Um, but um, then again, the question is, how likely is competition enforcement? I mean, if the European Union and the Commission decides to engage in a joint competition, a joint uh, purchasing arrangement, how likely is it, for instance, that the European Commission will intervene on competition or grounds? I, I don't really see that happening. Um, but, uh, but obviously, you could have national competition authorities, and I'll come back to that later. And also you could have international competition uh, rules. I mean, you will be dealing with, with, um, with the other um, uh, uh, sellers in other countries. Uh, so, so you might get other, those kinds of issues. And obviously I'm not certain that the uh, member states would be able to do this uh, fully on their own. I, it's not, at least in my opinion, not unlikely that they would have to involve uh, also private operators. And for them, obviously, uh, competition law issues would arise, and maybe they would have business in these other jurisdictions and could be exposed also to, to international competition laws. Uh, and obviously, as, uh, as Ignacio mentioned, there is also a question of whether private entities may also engage in some form of joint purchasing under, under, uh, under these times where, where, where actually gas is, is very expensive and they might look at, at means or possibilities to, to try to strengthen their negotiation, negotiating position. So I think that joint purchasing in, in some form involving private entities, either together with the, with the member states or, um, it, or private entities more or less on their own, more or less sanctioned by member states or commission is where competition law 
issues are most likely to actually arise. Uh, the first thing you think about when you are a practicing lawyer and someone comes to you and wants to discuss the opportunity of doing joint purchasing is really, uh, you have to think about what markets uh, will this affect. And when it comes to joint purchasing, you have to define and look at both the purchasing markets and also the selling markets. And market definitions are in general often very complex uh, and then represent legal uncertainty and legal uncertainty is risk for companies um, and in this case uh, we're talking about gas markets I mean there might be several gas markets uh, which are relevant uh, both upstream and downstream uh, and the geographic scope of those markets may, may also be, be different so this is something you would have to take into assessment uh, the second thing you would have to think about is how how would you structure this and now i'm kind of keeping within the european union uh, legislation um, we have both the behavioral rules uh, such as uh, 101 and 102 and then of course you have the structural rules the merger regulation uh, often when when uh, entities come to you and, uh, and say we want to explore a possibility of doing a joint venture you want to, the first thing, you, some of the things you want to do and sure is that, or explore is whether you can uh, structure this as a, as a full function joint venture. Because if you can, then you can, if the merger thresholds, merger notification thresholds are fulfilled, then you can notify and you can get the clearance or perhaps a no, but then at least you know that, that they didn't fly. But in general, the full function joint be joint uh, venture requirements are are not easy to fulfill if we are talking about joint purchasing first of all you need to establish joint control and secondly you must uh, establish an entity that uh, on a lasting basis and that means for several years will perform all the functions of an autonomous economic entity and um, especially uh, the last point on this slide, if you are just doing purchasing, uh, then you might it, it might seem that you're only carrying out a specific function, and then you will probably not qualify as a full function joint venture. I mean, there might be ways around this, we'll see, but I think as a starting point, I don't I think that's probably going to be a bit difficult. And secondly, also it takes time. It's also a question of how much time do you have? Because setting up that kind of full function joint venture, it's actually it takes time. It's lots of negotiations. It's lots of uh, uh, company related issues, shareholder control, things that need to be discussed and also notification and approval and the merger control regulations. It's not usually very speedy. Um, so um, then thinking that you will actually be doing your assessment under Article uh, 101, the prohibition on anti-competitive agreements. Um, first of all, you have to ask, is there a restriction under, uh, under 101, the first uh, 111? And uh, Again, you have to look at both the purchase and selling markets. And I think uh, as uh, Lars mentioned, I think it's it will be difficult to have a joint purchase arrangement without any form, or, or probably we have, at least if you want to achieve um, the, the objectives that you want this joint purchasing uh, arrangement to have, that you, I mean, how would you, um, um, regulate what to, what to do with the gas once you've bought it. I mean, if everyone could uh, do whatever they wanted, it, you might just kind of uh, push the problem uh, one step further uh, down the um, down the supply chain. Um, and also, you have to both consider whether there might be a restriction of object and also secondly uh, whether there might be restrictive effects uh, current guidelines give you a safe harbor um, if your joint market share is 
fifteen percent or lower on provided that it's not a, a restriction on objects. Uh, but then again, that kind of goes also back to the question of how um, how do you define the markets? Uh, it's often uh, difficult to be quite certain that you're actually uh, below this threshold unless it's very clear guidelines uh, or, or the market definition is very clear. In joint purchasing, uh, it's also you also have the issue of, of joint of exchange of information, um, volume requirement. I mean, if you're going to make a joint purchase arrangement effective, you often need to share information about volume requirements, uh, delivery uh, requirements, um, delivery dates, delivery times, and those kind of issues. And if you're not allowed to share that kind of data, it often will make the joint venture much less or joint purchasing um, arrangement much more or much less efficient for the parties. So that's uh, that's also a problem uh, if uh, so so you you know you have clients who have this idea about setting up a joint venture purchasing arrangement and when you talk to them about, about all the things they cannot do in that sense many of them see okay then we won't get the benefits that we were hoping for. Um, secondly, of course, even if you should fall within, uh, there, there should be a uh, restriction, you might consider whether, there, whether you, the joint venture or the purchase, joint purchasing arrangement would be liable for exemption under, uh, under um, for, for an individual exemption. And that's also often a very difficult um, as, um, assessment to make. And it also involves a lot of risk because uh, the assumptions that you may um, may not necessarily be shared by competition authorities. Um, I mean, the guidelines on, on the, both the existing and the new draft guidelines on, on the horizontal agreements do give some guidelines. There is always there's always this uh, inherent risk of um, or have you gotten your assessment wrong? Would competition authorities share your assessments in respect of uh, will consumers benefit and, and so on? Or have you done more than what was actually necessary? Uh, so uh, what we've seen so far is that the European Competition Network has given a statement uh, regarding the situation in Ukraine, which would probably also have, um, uh, apply to energy uh, joint purchasing. Um, but it's a, it's a statement which, in my opinion, is, is a very high level. Uh, it says um, that the uh, members of the European Competition Network will not actively intervene against necessary and temporary measures put in place in order to avoid, uh, avoid a shortage of supply. But then again, what is necessary? Uh, it also says, uh, which I've highlighted below, that, um, that if you're in doubt, you could reach out to the commission or national competition authorities for uh, informal guideline, guideline guidance. Um, in practice, that's, uh, I mean, it might be that they will be more forthcoming in respect of this, but uh, getting informal guideline guidance from at least Norwegian Competition Authority is extremely difficult unless you're a very small entity without access to legal resources, because usually you're told to make your own assessments. And um, I would also just mention the uh, Eurogas position paper, which came out on the 19th of April, which is just uh, a little bit less than a month after this statement by the European Competition Network. Uh, and I, th I think they, like me, is, were not very much impressed by the legal certainty that this, this um, ECN statement was given, because they say that any task force uh, must have a broad exemption from competition law, unless it will be just too complicated and, and difficult to set up a system which will actually work in practice. 
So from a practical pr perspective, what I th think is needed is actually more specific and what I would also call non-deceptive guidance. Um, I think we need to, uh, the EU European Union would have to regulate, either give some new uh, directives or regulations, or at least issue much more clear guidelines in order to create a safe harbor. Um, they can do this in, in various ways, of course. One way is to raise market share levels. Uh, but then again, if you only give indication of market share, share levels, that might give you a bit of a um, uh, kind of... Um, and so it, it doesn't, um, it, that's a bit deceptive, like formal guidelines, because you need to combine market share levels with market definitions. Because if you don't know exactly what kind of market definition the competition authorities with that will end up with, um, then information about market share levels is has limited value. And I also think it would be uh, important to avoid language that's that strictly necessary because it creates a lot of uncertainty as to what is actually necessary. And, uh, and the, guide, the guidance could, I think, also, um, where I think it would be advantage if the guidance also would explain what kind of information can be exchanged uh, and how, what kind of limitations or uh, will be accepted in respect of how to uh, dispose of the gas that you have bought. Uh, and obviously, uh, any guidelines or, or EU regulation would have to, in respect of Norway, be transformed or, or implemented in the EEA agreement as well. Um, as for the question of um, national competition law, uh, I think uh, it's likely that, um, that the regulation 203 would probably solve or hopefully solve this so that you wouldn't have you wouldn't face the risk of, of having national competition to apply to an agreement which is considered legal under the uh, EU regulations. Uh, from a practical perspective, I would find it a bit strange if a national competition authority would intervene in something which has been approved by or is very clearly indicated that would be illegal under European competition law. So I don't really see that much uh, a big risk there. Um, from a practical perspective. So, um, but then again, this is just the competitional issues. I mean, there's so many other things that could go wrong. Um, I think from a, from a legal or lawyer perspective, I think competition law might, might not be the biggest uh, obstacle. Um, but I think there's, it's a lot more uh, it's a it's a quite complicated setup. Uh, it's uh, international sellers. Um, how many entities would join, um, and and so on and so on. And and you have also all these sellers in 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 other countries, uh, state-owned companies. And I'm not really think, talking about the Norwegian Equinor companies, but more you have uh, companies in in states uh, in the Arab world, in which have other issues such as human rights issues, and, and they might also have other political considerations um, in respect of the this issue. So I think it's going to be a challenging uh, issue, and it's going to be very interesting to see how how, it, how this will play out. And that's my comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica, for that presentation. Very interesting to hear your practical call perspectives. And I think it's important also that we remember that this is something that has to be done in practice and not only purely academically. So having your intervention here is very valuable for us. So with that being said, I would like to thank all the speakers today, excluding myself. I should not thank myself, but really thank you so very much, Monica, Lee, and Lush for this excellent presentations. And what we'll do is we'll stop the recording now so we can have a proper discussion without you feeling restrained by this.